We have been studying about the greatest imitator of the Lord Jesus Christ, the devil. Now this is a subject that the devil does not like Christians to learn about. It is something that he wants to keep under covers. The devil hates it when his identity is exposed. The devil hates it when his tactics, his devices are exposed and Christians become wiser about his wiles. He doesn't like it. So he does everything he can to keep Christians in the dark about who he truly is and what he truly can do. That's why Christians, to the most part, have a very wrong idea about the devil and about his tricks and about how far he can go in deceiving uh, God's people and this world. Remember this, the devil's greatest tool is deception. And that's what he did with Eve at the very beginning when he deceived her into listening to him and obeying his words rather than the words of God. So the devil's greatest weapon is deception and the devil uses it in various ways to, peep, uh, to keep not only Christians but even uh, unbelievers in delusion, in deception and in darkness. And God's word, the Holy Scriptures, throws a great deal of light on this subject so that you and I can learn about the devices of the devil. We can learn about his wiles and how he deceives people so that we may protect ourselves from this deception. And if you are entrapped in such a deception, God wants you to come out of it. And the only way to come out of it is the help, with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ through the scriptures. That's the only way uh, you can ever get out of the traps and the delusions that the devil may have put you in. The word of God is the only way in which you can come out of this darkness, out of those traps and out of those delusions. The Bible is light and this light can dispel that darkness the devil would bring into the lives of Christians and non-Christians. We have seen especially how the devil tries to cover up his identity in the modern English versions. We have seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1 in the King James Bible it says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. But in the new versions, now this is the KJV, but in the new versions they use the word imitators instead of followers. And we have seen that Imitators is a, a very wrong word to use when it comes to following the Lord Jesus Christ because it is nothing but counterfeit. And that's what the devil likes to do. He likes to counterfeit God's work. And not only in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, but in many other places, we have seen that the devil tries to hide his identity, the devil tries to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ and ultimately what he's trying to do is he's trying to make Christians believe that he is just like the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the greatest counterfeit of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen in the beginning in the first Bible study how the devil does it. We have seen in the parable of the wheat and tares in Matthew chapter 13 how the devil's work imitates God's work so closely that it's almost impossible at the beginning to see the difference. Jesus says in that parable, the son of man says in that parable, uh, let the wheat and the tares grow together because if you try to separate them now, you may harm the wheat while trying to pluck out the tares. That's how exactly the devil copies the work of God. And that's how he's been doing uh, since his fall. That's how he's been imitating God from the beginning. We have also seen uh, two specific ways in which the devil imitates or counterfeits God or the Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen firstly that the devil is a counterfeit king. God is a great king. Jesus Christ is the king of kings and lord of lords. And the devil is a counterfeit king. And we have also seen how the devil very soon will send, him, um, send in his own son or his own king to rule the earth. We have also seen that God is light and Jesus Christ is light. 
and we have seen that the devil is counterfeit light and we have seen how the devil counterfeits God's light especially in the modern English versions. Now let me take a few seconds to say this before I move forward. I've been getting a lot of criticism for these Bible studies not because of the doctrine I'm teaching when it comes to all these things, the subject that we are studying, but when it comes to my faith in the King James Bible as the inerrant, infallible Word of God. I believe that God has preserved all His words in the King James Bible. I also believe this, that the King James Bible is an advanced revelation over the original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts or the original Greek and Hebrew in which God had given uh, the scriptures at the beginning. They're saying all sorts of things. Some people say, I am teaching this, that the King James Bible is the inspired word of God, that God's breath is upon it because I'm ignorant of this subject of manuscript evidence. Somebody else said that I have never read the Koine Greek or studied it, so I have absolutely no clue what I'm talking about. Somebody said uh, that I even am teaching this subject because I get money from overseas uh, by King James, from King James Bible believers and that's why I'm teaching this doctrine. Well, I really don't have the time to refute all these things. I don't have the time to talk about all these things. But let me just say one thing. It is a conviction that God has given me. It was in 1999 and 2000, between 1999 and 2000 when I was a young Christian that God opened my eyes to see that the King James Bible is the preserved words of God. All right. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you think my motive is. It really doesn't matter. I believe this book. I preach it and I teach it. That's it. So you can go ahead and call me what you like. You can. This is nothing new to King James Bible believers. All right. Well, since we have begun making these videos, now the criticism is coming from more places than usual. That's all. But there's nothing new. And uh, remember this. The difference between us and those people who don't believe the King James Bible is this. We are saying that God has given one book as the final authority for faith and conduct for the Christians in these last days. Just one book. But what they believe is that there is absolutely no Bible which is without any errors. That means they have no final authority. You ask them, do you have a Bible? They'll say, yes, I have a Bible. Do you believe the NIV that you're using is the perfect, infallible, inerrant word of God? They'll have no answer for that. They'll say, no, it's got mistakes in it. Then you don't have a Bible. They say, we believe in the original autographs in the inspiration of the original autographs. But you see, there are no original autographs existing today. What we have are only copies and that too, not uh, complete copies sometimes, and sometimes they're contradicting each other. So did God lose his words? They cannot get themselves, uh, themselves to believe that God has the power to preserve his words in a translation. Why is it so difficult to believe that? Go ahead and study manuscript evidence. Go ahead and study church history and you will see how God has preserved his pure words in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament throughout church history until it was finally translated into the English language in 1611 in the King James Bible or the Authorized Version. Well, that's all I have to say about this. I don't want to get uh, too deep into answering every criticism that is thrown my way because that's not the purpose why we are making these Bible studies. We are making these Bible studies to build up Christians in this book, not in some Hebrew or Greek scriptures, <clears throat> not uh, in some lost manuscripts. We are trying to build up Christians in this King James Bible and the truth and the doctrine that it teaches to us. We are trying to help Christians see more light in this book and help them to study that book by themselves, not depending on Greek and Hebrew scholars. You don't need that. You, if you read the Bible in the English, you can read it in the King James Version and God will show you much more than all these Greek and Hebrew scholars can ever learn <clears throat> by trusting their own scholarship. 
All right, so we also hope and pray that many unsaved people would come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ through these Bible studies. We have seen already that the devil is a great counterfeit light and a great counterfeit king. Today we are going to see the devil's counterfeit as counterfeit God. As counterfeit God. <clears throat> Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, <clears throat> seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. In the King James Bible it says, God was manifest in the flesh talking about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whereas in the new versions, in many of them, <clears throat> the word God has been substituted by He. So this is how it would read in the new versions. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh. What does it mean? Who was manifest in the flesh? You see how they remove, they attack the deity of Jesus Christ in these modern versions and Christians still think it's absolutely all right they think it's all right if words have been removed or verses have been removed from uh, these modern versions they have absolutely no problem about that <clears throat> they think that the King James Bible is any other version like all the other modern versions it is not it is the only Bible that God honors because it's the only Bible that contains all the words of God as God has given them to us through his prophets and apostles. <clears throat> so Jesus Christ is said to be God, God himself, manifest in the flesh. And the devil imitates Jesus Christ as God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The devil is called, Satan is called the God of this world. Just as Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. The devil's greatest desire has been from the beginning to be like God. That was why he sinned and rebelled against God. Because he wanted to be like God from the beginning. In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 14 it says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That is the ultimate desire of the devil. To be like the Most High. To be like God. <clears throat> so what does he do? So he blinds the minds of people in this world so that they would not believe in the true God, the Lord Jesus Christ, but would believe a false God, the devil, and his followers. He has deceived them into believing that he and his other fallen angels together are gods really who ought to be feared and worshipped. <clears throat> That's how he has deceived the world as a counterfeit God. Not only Satan, but as I've said, even his followers, there are many, many fallen angels that uh, Satan commands and all of them together deceive the people of this world into believing that they are gods. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, it says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as they be God's many and Lord's many. <clears throat> Most Christians don't believe this, but angels are called gods in the Bible, especially the fallen angels. And angels of God are called the sons of God. And many Christians don't believe this. They think uh, the only gods in this world are the idols that the people of this world worship. That's not true. There are some living gods in this world and we will look at who they are in a minute now in 1st Corinthians 8 5 Paul makes it very clear for though they be that are called gods 
Where are these gods? Whether in heaven or in earth. You see that. Idols cannot be in heaven. But fallen angels can be in the second heaven. So Paul is referring to these fallen angels and not to idols. Uh, fallen angels are called gods. And these gods are behind the idols that people worship in this world. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy 32 verse 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that newly came up, that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. That makes it very clear. There are beings called gods and these gods are devils and that's as plain uh, as it can get. Uh, there are devils and these devils are gods. Actually, these are gods with a small g. These are gods and those devils are gods <clears throat> and they are worshipped by people and these are they which are behind uh, these idols. Look at what Paul says again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. When the Gentiles sacrifice to their idols, they are actually sacrificing to devils. Do you see that? Behind every idol is a devil and that devil is the God who is being worshipped by the people who sacrifice to that idol or worship that idol. So there are gods and these gods are not dead idols. These gods are living beings. What is the origin of these gods? Does the Bible have something to say about these gods? Well, it does. The Bible has a lot to say about these gods and we will look at a few things for us to get a clear understanding as to who these gods are who counterfeit the one true living God. Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now again in the new versions and uh, in most commentaries that you read on the Bible, you will see that they say the King James Bible is wrong. It should not be God's plural, but it should be God singular. <clears throat> they suppose that there is only one God that is true, one true living God, a true God. The, the true God is only one. But Paul said there are gods many and lords many. Remember that. But these scholars don't believe the Bible, you see. Whenever the Bible seems to be contradicting their belief, they change the scriptures to match their beliefs. All right. They immediately go to the Hebrew and uh, do all those gymnastics there to try to show that they are right and the King James Bible is wrong. <clears throat> it is God's plural, not a singular God. And these gods are fallen angelic beings which were there on the earth and Adam and Eve could see them just as they could see Lucifer or Satan as he came to them in the form of a serpent. They could see those fallen angels. They knew these are the sons of God. All right. And that's what the devil promised Adam and Eve. He said, you will be like them in knowledge, knowing good and evil. In other words, the devil offered them a free education. Just like these Bible scholars, they study and study and study and become Bible critics and Bible rejectors and ultimately trust their own intellect and their own uh, scholarship than trust God. And that's what the devil offered to Adam and Eve in the beginning. He said, the moment you eat this fruit, he said to Eve, your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods knowing good and evil. A false promise, but... The de uh, but Eve was deceived by that false promise. Alright, so once again, the gods are angels. And uh, the devil said to Eve, you will be like the angels. Look at the knowledge they possess. And you will get the same knowledge as them. 
if you eat this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And Eve took the bait and you know what happened after that. In Psalm 82, verses 1, 6 and 7. I'll be reading verses 1, 6 and 7 uh, in Psalm 82. It says a Psalm of Asaph. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. What is this talking about? It says, he judgeth among the gods. What does it mean? Is he judging among idols? Is that what God is doing? No, he's judging these gods, these fallen angels who pretend to be gods and who uh, are worshipped by the people of this world. Uh, as uh, you know, they are ignorant that they are actually worshipping devils. Not only that, he's, it says here, I have said ye are gods. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ applies verse 6 to the Jews. But that is a spiritual application. Alright? That's a spiritual application. The context is verse 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. He's not judging the Jews. He's judging the gods. That's the context, verse 1. Then verse 6, I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. But look at this last part in verse 7. But ye shall die like men. You are gods, but you will die like men. That's what God said to these gods. What is this passage talking about? Did you ever think about it? In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12, let's look at this once again. It says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both small, uh, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. What is God saying? Is he saying he's going to judge all the idols of Egypt? Is that what God doing? Judging dead inanimate things? No. He is he's going to judge the gods of Egypt, that is, the devils behind the idols that the people worshipped. And this is something you need to understand. That the origin of these gods on the earth is found in Genesis chapter 6. And only in the light of Genesis chapter 6 can you understand Psalm 82, the passage that we have just read where God says to these gods, You are gods, but you will die like men. Look at Exodus chapter 15 and verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Is God being compared to inanimate idols? I don't think so. There are gods many and God is the greatest. Who is like unto thee among the gods? There is none like him among the gods. So what I'm trying to say here is that gods in the Bible are not necessarily idols all the time. There are times in the Bible when gods are addressed and these gods are devils or fallen angels. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 22 and verse 28. Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. Thou shalt not revile the gods. Is God saying you shall, you, you, that you should not revile those idols? Is that what he's saying? No, he's talking about the gods behind those idols. And you need to understand this. That these gods imitate the one true living God. They are counterfeit gods. And they lead the people who worship them into eternal damnation. Psalm 82, once again, let me say this, cannot be understood except in the light of Genesis chapter 6. He is talking about fallen angels. He is talking about the angels who came to the earth in the days of Noah and cohabited with the daughters of men. Look at Genesis chapter 6. We'll read verses 1, 2 and 4. Genesis 6, 1, 2 and 4. And it came to pass when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God 
came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. This is where it all began in Genesis chapter 6, in the days of Noah. These fallen angels came down to the earth and cohabited with the daughters of men. Now I know all the objections that you may have about how angels cannot procreate. Well, you don't have any evidence for that. You will go to Matthew chapter 17 trying to say uh, that, you know, angels in heaven do not marry. Well, angels in heaven do not marry. And uh, it does not say that they do not have the power to procreate. These angels in Genesis 6 are not angels in heaven. They are fallen angels who have left their first estate, Jude verse 6, and they have come down to the earth. And here, uh, we will not get into the technicalities of it, but they would have procured the ability to procreate. All right, with the great wisdom and knowledge that God had made them with, they would have somehow made it possible for them to get blood inside their bodies and then they would uh, procreate. And that's why God said to them, you are gods, but you will die like men in the flood of Noah. That means when these fallen angels came down and cohabited with the daughters of men, they lost their original uh, powers, their original uh, standing. They were completely different. Now they became as men and they could die. This may seem very far-fetched to you, but sit down, think about it, pray about it and read and study the scriptures on the subject. And you will see that what I'm saying is true. These angels who left their first estate, came and cohabited with the daughters of men, became like human beings, had children, and these children were monsters. They were not ordinary children, they were giants. And they were mighty men, men of renown of old. These are the gods, these are the demigods of Greek uh, uh, mythology. These are the demigods of Hindu mythology, half man, half god. That's what these creatures are who were born to angels, fallen angels, and the daughters of men. These are the gods who are worshipped by people today. So the fallen angels and their offspring both are worshipped as God. I don't have the time to give you examples, but you can think of many of them if you take the time to do so. Think of these ancient religions in the world and think of the gods they worship. You have there what happened in Genesis chapter 6 genetically modified animals and humans. So you have half human, half man uh, uh, creatures which are worshipped as gods. Do you know any religion where there are half animal and uh, half man creatures which are worshipped as gods? I know many. And that's how the devil has been working since the beginning of time. It all started in the days of Noah when these fallen angels came down to earth. And uh, of course, all these foolish arguments about the sons of God in Genesis 6 are the sons of Seth marrying the daughters of men, which are the daughters of Cain, is rubbish. Okay, that's not the way you uh, interpret the Bible. You do it honestly. With the final authority, one book, this is what happens when you go to Hebrew and confuse yourself with all that, you'll never learn any truth. You stick to the book God has given us in these last days, the King James Bible, and you read it and believe it. And then you will see God will open up a lot of truth to you. He will show you a lot of truth. So in Genesis 6, it's not the daughters of or the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain. It is the sons of God and the daughters of men. The sons of Seth are not the sons of God. No, they are not. They are the sons or the descendants of Adam, made in the image of Adam. Look at Job chapter 1 and verse 6 to understand who these sons of God are. Job chapter 1 verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. Let scripture interpret scripture. Sons of God here are not the, the, the sons of Seth. Are you saying that the sons of Seth appeared before God one day? It's very clear, it's angels. The sons of God 
came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And a couple of other times in the book of Job you see that the sons of God is a reference to angels. And in Genesis 6, the sons of God are fallen angels. And they cohabited with men. These fallen angels and the giant children that were born to them are the gods of every religion today. And all their idols that they make and they worship uh, are the idols or the gods that they worship before the flood. You know, this is how it uh, happened. The gods came down in the days of Noah and they were worshipped as God. Their offspring were worshipped as gods. And then God wiped out that generation because they, all flesh was corrupt. They were genetically corrupt except the family of Noah. So God destroyed the entire earth and all its population with a flood. But after the flood, in the days of Nimrod and Semiramis' wife, they once again started worshipping the gods of old. And those devils were worshipped as gods and uh, they made images of uh, these gods and started worshipping the images. And when they did that, they were actually worshipping the gods or the devils behind those idols. This is how it all began. First, Nimrod and his wife are the ones who would have started this idol worship, but these idols are the idols of gods who lived in the days of Noah. They are fallen angels and their offspring. So the devil and his angels have deceived the world into believing that they are gods and they should be worshipped. Also the Bible translators, don't forget these fellows now, these Bible translators of the new versions help the devil every single time and try to cover up his identity so that people will not realize that they are falling into the trap of the devil. Be careful Christians, these modern English Bible versions lead you straight to a trap, straight into a trap. And they will lead you into false doctrine. They will lead you into uh, backsliding and finally apostasy. That's what it's going to do to you. Already the lukewarmness that we have is a direct result of the new versions. And there is not a single church or a single Christian who does not get affected with this lukewarmness. But if you take the path of the New English versions, the end would be total apostasy, as we see among most of Christianity today in these last days. So the origin of these gods, understand that it's Genesis chapter 6. Now we look further and see that the devil desires worship just as God desires worship. Now it's true that God desires to be worshipped and God's desire to be worshipped is a legitimate desire. God is worthy of worship and even when God desires to be worshipped, there is nothing wrong because God is just being honest. He is who he is and therefore he should be worshipped. God desires worship. Look at John chapter 4, the gospel of John chapter 4 and verse 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God desires that true worshippers should worship him in spirit and truth. It's a legitimate desire that God has to be worshipped. But look at this. Look at Luke chapter 4. And we'll read verses 5 to 7. Luke chapter 4 verses 5 through 7. And the devil taking him up into an high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Look at verse 7. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. You see how the devil desires to be worshipped, not just by people, but the devil desires to be worshipped by the Son of God in the flesh himself. That's the extent of desire that the devil has to be worshipped as God. But uh, look at the same uh, incident in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 9 and look at how Matthew puts it. And saith unto him, all these things will I give thee 
if thou wilt fall down and worship me. That's the devil's desire, that you should fall down before him, that Jesus Christ should fall down before him and worship him. Isn't that something? The devil is a god. He's the god of the world. And his fallen angels are the gods who are worshipped in this world. All the while they have been worshipped as gods. But you know there's something very interesting. And it is this that these gods are going to return very soon. Look at Luke chapter 17. The gospel of Luke chapter 17. And we'll read verses 26 to 30. Gospel of Luke chapter, 16, chapter 17 verses 26 to 30. And as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. <clears throat> Here Jesus Christ is talking about his second coming. And he said that the second coming or the days before the second coming of Christ to the earth, it would be like the days, like the days of Noah. The days of Noah. And he also said it would be like the days of Lot. We have already seen that the days of Noah are characterized by the coming of the sons of God to the earth and cohabiting with the daughters of men. So once again, the gods are coming back. That's what the days of Noah is all about. Not just about eating and drinking, but this was a major thing. The reason why God destroyed the earth with a flood because, was because of the gods and uh, what they did with mankind. They corrupted all flesh. It was a genetic corruption of flesh. So that people were no longer normal human beings. The whole of human race and even the animals for that matter were mongrelized completely. It became a mongrel race. It was no longer a human race which could be redeemed. And that's what the Antichrist would be doing in the tribulation with his mark of the beast. He would seek to mongrelize the human race so that they become transhuman, more than human. They become above humans so that their souls cannot be redeemed anymore. And uh, a very interesting study was done on uh, this genetic engineering that these scientists are engaged in today. And a very uh, leading scientist on this subject said these words. She said, if a human being is genetically modified 1%, that's all it takes for him to cease to be a human being. That's very, very interesting and very scary. At the same time, when the Antichrist comes with his mark, with that chip or whatever other technology they may have in those days, uh, and when that mark is taken in the forehead or in the hand, that person is genetically modified. And one percent of that is enough to stop him from being a normal human being and make him beyond redemption. That's why uh, in the book of Revelation it says, if anyone takes the mark of the beast, they will be cast into the lake of fire. They cannot be redeemed. And that's very, very scary to think about, that so many millions of people in the world in the tribulation would actually take this mark of the beast and they can never be saved again. They will go to hell. That's why we need to do as Christians all that we can to snatch them out of the fires of hell now while the time is still there before the tribulation begins. That's why we need to be working hard to win souls. So in the days of Noah, the gods came. The gods came and they genetically modified humans. And that's what is going to happen in the future. 
Now again in the days of Lot, Jesus said that the days of the second coming would be like the days of Lot. What happened in the days of Lot? The, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah went after strange flesh. What was that strange flesh? Whom did they uh, seek to go after? Those were angels of God in the form of men that came to save Lot. Remember that. And these men knew that just as they knew it in the days of Noah. And they wanted this unnatural relationship with angels in human form as it happened in the days of Noah. So the most important aspect of the days of Noah and the days of Lot is the coming again of the gods. That's very, very important for you to understand. Uh, look at uh, Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17 and we will read verse 12. Revelation 17 verse 12 says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings, one hour with the beast. So you have here ten horns, which are ten kings. And if you read the rest of the chapter, you will see that these are not ordinary kings. These are ten kings who will be ruling the whole world. And these ten kings will be given power to rule for one hour. And in that one hour, they would appoint the Antichrist as the ruler of the world. They give all their power and authority to the Antichrist. These are some special kind of kings. These are not ordinary human beings. How can I say that? Look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 verses 42 and 43. Daniel 2, 42 and 43. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Alright, so that's the first thing you need to understand. Here he's looking at that great colossus. Uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and he's describing it and he's interpreting the meaning of that Colossus and he's talking about the feet now and he says the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken that's one part of the interpretation now look at verse 43 and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay this is the second interpretation they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Look at those, wor those words. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. The clay here is a reference to human beings, like Adam was made out of clay. And the iron is to do with the fallen angels. There is here a mixture of the fallen angels and human beings once again as it was in the days of Noah and Daniel here is interpreting the meaning of the ten toes. So these ten horns and the ten toes of Daniel are one and the same and these ten toes are a mixture of iron and clay. They could be once again like the giants who were born when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. So these are not ordinary kings. These will be demigods once again upon the earth, ruling the earth, and above them will be the Antichrist, the son of the devil. Look at it, it all falls into place. So many things in the scripture that were a bit difficult to understand before would become clear when you compare scripture with scripture and rightly divide the word of truth. So what I'm trying to say is that the origin of these gods who imitate the Lord Jesus Christ is Genesis chapter 6. And throughout the history of the earth, they have been worshipped as idols. But behind the idols are these devils. But the most important thing is that they are coming back. It will be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. In both these times, it, uh, you know, the most important thing are the role of the gods. They saw, even in the days of Lot, they saw the angels and they said, the gods have come. And uh, because they knew what happened in the days of Noah and the gods came, they said, 
Let's do it all over again. And God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah completely. These gods are coming back. And these gods will be worshipped once again as the great demigods of so many ancient religions. Look at also 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll read verses 3 and 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You see that? This man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, he exalted himself above all that is called God. He exalted himself above all that is called God. That was the original desire of the devil. Remember to be uh, like God. In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 14 we read, he said, I will be like the most high. That is his original desire. And he sends in his son into the world with that same desire. He exalts him, uh, himself above all that is called God. So it's the devil saying once again, I will be like the Most High. And he tries to realize uh, his desire through his son, the Antichrist, who will be king on the earth for seven years. And it says here about him, he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. That's the first thing. Second thing, he as God sitteth in the temple of God. So just like the devil wanted to sit uh, on the throne up there in the third heaven, the Antichrist will sit in the temple. The rebuilt temple of the Jews. And he will be in the temple as God. Showing himself that he is God. And the people of the world will worship him as God. Look at also Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So here you have them worshipping the dragon. That is the devil. And the beast, which is the Antichrist. Both of them are worshipped by the people of this world as gods. And for a short time, for a very short period of time, the devil fulfills his desire to be as God and to be worshipped as God. As the people of the world in the tribulation worship the dragon and they worship the beast and say, Who is like unto the beast? Like those great saints said, who is like unto God among the gods? The people of this world will worship the devils and the fallen angels and antichrist in the coming great tribulation. What a horrible time that would be. But the thing for you to understand is that the devil counterfeits everything that God does. He counterfeits God as a king or the Lord Jesus Christ as a king. He counterfeits Jesus Christ as light. He counterfeits Jesus Christ as, as God. And there are so many people who believe it. Now, once again, let me remind you that the devil does not like to be exposed. He hates it. So if you read the King James Bible and study it, he will be exposed. You will see his true colors. But when you read the modern versions, is camouflaged in those modern versions and you will not be able to see him for who he is. That's why it's important that you study the scriptures, the King James Bible, and believe the scriptures and ask God to help you to understand them. I would like to say these words to you if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible says that if you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
the wrath of God abides on you. That means God is angry with you. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You are a sinner and uh, you're going to be paid wages and the wages of your sin is death. And I'm, just not I'm not just talking about physical death, but I'm also talking to you about eternal death. The Bible says that everyone whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life were cast into the lake of fire. That's where you will spend eternity if you don't trust Jesus Christ as your savior. And the reason for this is because you are a sinner. You're born into this world with a sin nature. And because you have the sin nature, as you grow up, you start sinning and doing wickedness in your life. And because of all these reasons, you will be cast into the lake of fire. But of course, the most important reason why you will be cast into hell is because you will not trust Jesus Christ as your savior. Why should you trust in Jesus Christ as your savior? Because Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He came to this world to take your place and your punishment. He suffered on the cross, he bled and he died to pay the penalty for your sins, to take the punishment which you deserve. He died, he was buried and he rose up again on the third day according to the scriptures for you so that you may trust him and receive him as your savior. Then and only then would you be declared righteous before God because Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God and you receive him into your heart as your savior by faith in his finished work. You have him, you have the righteousness of God inside of you and you would be delivered from hell and you would be saved and taken to heaven one day when the Lord returns or when you die. Do not delay this very important thing that you need to do. You need to trust in Jesus Christ right now as your savior. And if you do it, he will forgive you of all your sins, give you eternal life, give you a new beginning, an abundant life, a life which is characterized by joy and peace and strength to live a godly and a holy life. God wants you. To do that. Your good works cannot save you. You remember that. Your religion cannot save you. Going to church cannot save you. Taking baptism cannot save you. Nothing in this world can save you except a person and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And you need to trust him as your personal savior. Do it and do it right now. Christians spend much time with this book, reading, studying, comparing scripture with scripture, asking God to help you to see more and more the things that he wants you to learn in the scripture. And may the Lord help you to do so. Amen.